We'd like to open with prayer, so if everybody would stand. Dear kind and gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day, Lord. And we thank you for the opportunity that you have given each one of us to serve this great city. We ask God for your guidance, for your leadership, and for your direction in everything that we do every day. We ask God that you would bless this meeting, that, that your will would ultimately ultimately be done in everything that we say and do today. It's in your precious holy name that we ask. Amen. Amen. Attention, salute, pledge. Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, we uh, we have uh, actually been been on the council now for close. We're getting close to a year. November will be a year, uh, and you know we're trying to trying to do the right thing on everything that we do. Uh, trying to make sure that uh, we take care of the citizens of Fort Payne and. Um, Wade has graciously put together a capital improvement plan and uh, wanted to present to the council today. Uh, so at this time, Wade, if you want to tell us about your plan. All right, thank you, Brian. I think we're at the point in our lives here in Fort Payne where we've got to make an important decision. Uh, we started last year, uh, even before this time, gathering facts and getting information because Three of us are new council members, so we were trying to find out what was going on, how things were looking. We've got two incumbents that came back on board, so the five of us have spent the last nine months together trying to figure out where Fort Payne's going to go. We know where we are, so we want to know where we're going to go and how we're going to get there. So in doing a little research and putting things together and compiling the numbers that we needed to come up with, the things that we need to do, the things that people here want to do that have been uh, given to us as candidates and now council members. We, we tried to put together a wish list of what we need to do to go forward. So, and starting with that, we, we go to where we are money-wise. And our general fund revenue, as you'll notice, took a big dip several years ago. We lost several hundred dollars. <coughs> This city has been so resilient in overcoming what would have totally devastated a lot of other communities. We literally lost thousands of jobs, millions of dollars of revenue, and it's taken about seven years to come back to where we were. We were in a good position, uh, and we're in, a, we're in a stable position now, but we're in a position where we've got to do some additional things to move forward. So the, the revenues, as you can see, were, were good, but our fund, expenses are, are moving also. So you can track our, our revenues and our expenses over the last several years and they kind of mirror one another and then when you put them together on the same graph you get a better idea of where we are up and down and you can see the, the reddish color here that's expenses and the green color is revenue. So for several years we've been right at slightly below or sometimes quite a bit over our revenue. So that's not a position you can maintain long term. It's not been a terribly drastic deal, but there have been years where we've been over that and then we cut expenses. I, I will give Johnny and Red credit. Johnny's been here 21 years and Red's going on nine. They've done a great job of doing what they had to do to run the city with the revenue that we had to run it with. But the sad fact is that everybody around us raised taxes in the 90s and Fort Payne did. We've been running on sales tax revenue that was initiated in 1984. We haven't had an increase since then. So they've done an admirable job of keeping us afloat. But to move forward and grow, we've got to do some other initiatives here. Sales tax is our major general fund revenue. We get some apple oil taxes. And you can get a copy of the audit if you want to see exactly what our revenues and expenses are. But you see it in 08, 08 to 09, we went down 10, we bottomed out, then we started climbing back up. So it took seven years to get back to where we were. That 
that's seven years of lost revenue. So we had reserves in place that offset that, that maintained that balance, and we're to the point now where our reserves are getting to a point where we need to work on them. One of the things a lot of people talk about is, oh, you got alcohol tax, and that's quite a bit of money. Well, it's not as much money as you think. Alcohol tax peaked to $374,000 and has steadily declined. It's going down again this year because everybody around us that goes wet pulls sales from Fort Payne. Of that $374,000, and then this past year was a little over three, we give that all to the schools and to other entities. So the city gets no benefit from that money whatsoever. We just handle that money. We receive it, and quarterly we give it out. So we give the schools 75%, another 25% goes to economic development and other things. And I think we basically banked $500 off of that one year for, for handling and interest and whatever. But our bond debt, on the other hand, is a number that you want to see go down. So you can see in, in uh, 08, we have 23.8 million. In 15, it's down to 13.2. We're on track to pay our bond debt off in 25. Okay, 25. That doesn't sound like a long time, but we're paying it off with a few million dollars at a time. That money comes in, it goes out. The problem with our bond debt issue that I see is everything that we got those bonds for has now got some age on it, and we can't repair or replace some of these things without additional money. So as we continue to pay our bond debt down, we've got to look at what we're going to do to get money in to do new things, to expand our, our beneficial things for our citizens. So yeah, our sales tax is going up. Our bond debt's going down, but our revenues and expenses are kind of paralleling each other to the point where we're not gaining any real ground there. We've got one bond that pays off, uh, we've got a payment next month, and then we've got one more next year. That will free up $750,000 a year. We've got another bond that pays out, and it's way on down the road. It's like six, seven years out, so it will potentially save us $800,000 a year. But we're talking about six, seven years down the road. We've got to make some decisions now to see where we're going to be in six or seven years. We can't, can't wait to get that far. So as our bond debt comes down, we're in a position now where one notch, I believe Randy said, one notch below our top rating that we could have as a, as a bond capable entity. So we're in a, we're in a great position to, to get some money if we need it. So if you're going to get bond money, what are you going to do to pay for it? So we've got some decisions to make. This is the most graphic chart that we've got is our cash reserves and you can see the steady decline there and that is to offset drops in revenue or purchases of capital so yeah we peaked out in 2010 at over 12 million dollars but we're down a little over six now so that's a serious decline what we're having to do now is basically take money out of our savings account to pay some of our bills we're having to shift money around to do certain things so if we're going to get in a position to do something, now it's time to do it. And this is one of the main reasons we've got to do that. And you say, well, you got six or seven million dollars in the bank. That's not a lot of money when you've got a multi-million dollar facility that you have to keep up, and that's the city of Fort Payne. Our payroll runs close to half a million dollars every two weeks. We've got benefits. We've got employees that want to get raises eventually. We gave them a raise this past year. The raise we just gave in November and the insurance that we assumed the increase in cost the city over $300,000. But that was the right thing to do, and we did it. We still passed the balanced budget. And to do that, we had to eliminate over a million dollars worth of capital requests in one day. And we did that. We sat down, we took that on, we did it. We gave our employees a raise, and we still passed a budget that showed basically a $70,000 surplus if everything goes well this year. So, when we get into the situation which we're at now, we've got to have <clears throat> things that we have to do. We've got short-term projects. And I say short-term because I used to do uh, three, five, 10, and 20-year plans. Our plan right now is one to five. This is what I consider a short-term project, something we've got to fund in the next short term. Number one is an ALDOT project that you're going to be seeing here pretty quickly. When the state comes in and brings us our funding agreement, we're going to proceed with a totally revamped and new interchange system at the 218 exit. You will have both sides of the interstate be totally redone. Airport Road and Jordan Road will be lined up facing each other and there will be turn lanes put in place where people can turn
turn from all four directions with a turn lane. And if you get a Lowe's, you can actually get back to full paint without waiting a day to do it. Okay. <laughs> our next thing is our sewer plant. The bond is paying off next year was primarily to uh, fix up the sewer plant 20 plus years ago. Things wear out. The things at sewer plants wear out quicker because they're 24-7, 365. There's always something going through there. You've always got to deal with maintenance issues. So to work on that plant, get some things fixed that we need to fix and, and do some improvements over there, we're looking at around $2 million there. Next, we've got the police department building, which was built in the 40s. It now houses our 911, our police department, our jail, the theater. We've got to do some major work on the marquee, and we've got to make a decision on how we're going to redo the front facade of that. What we'd like to do is go back to retro. It looks like neon, but it's not neon because it is just so expensive to keep up. We want to keep the look of that theater because it's part of our downtown heritage and our culture. The Doe building is the building at Fifth and Godfrey. We agreed to purchase that building, turn it into a military-style museum right across from where Patriots Park is going to be built, but that's going to take money to purchase and renovate. We're going to take the metal building off of it. It will be a freestanding building once again, and then the metal building behind it will turn into our uh, bank shop for our building crew. They will have their own building where they can store their stuff and work out there. The coal and iron building has to have the total upstairs finished. We're downstairs complete nearly. Upstairs has got to be addressed. We want to try to do that this winter. We've got our crew that's going to do that, but it's going to take money to do that. The pool needs major renovations or a look at replacing. It was built back in the 80s. It was built on leased property. The city had to go back and buy the pool back from the property owner, so it is actually ours now. But it's built in the 80s, so 30 years is a lot of wear and tear on things that get a lot of use. The sports complex was built, I think, in 1986. The pool was built right after that. The complex in its heyday was as good as anything in Alabama, something we were all proud of as we had our kids go through it, and now my grandkids are playing up there. But you can't have anything last 30 years without having to have some upgrades. We've got to have major renovations to the bathrooms and the concession area. We've got to address the situation there of how we're going to do and how extensive we're going to do and what we've got to be able to do. We had a major electrical deal we had to fix this year. Johnny was instrumental in getting that done. So everything up there has got to be fixed. And what a lot of people don't understand, and, and we were there when it happened, and Johnny saw this, they built that place as good as they could with the money they had. They got a lot of donated money for the soccer fields and the ball fields. So there was wire buried all over that place that was direct buried wire, but it's got a lifespan. Well, we're in its lifespan now. So we've got to address whether we've got to redo all that with conduit and wire, how we're going to do that, things like that. And they all cost a lot of money. So we got a lot of stuff there. We, I just kind of assigned a million dollars to those projects. And it would take much more than that. But it would take that just to minimally get those to a point of doing something. Our sanitation department is a point in their lifespan where we've got to expand the footprint in a few years. We've got to bank a million two to close the current landfill, make it a nice big green grassy field, move up the valley. We've got to buy some more property to move some uh, holding ponds up there to catch our runoff. That's all going to take money. We took a garbage truck we needed out of the budget. We got to put that back in. That's a quarter of a million dollars. We need a roll-off truck. We got a roll-off truck that's making 160 trips a year hauling materials. It's paid its way, but it's, it's getting worn out. If you could see the miles and the hours on the fleet at the sanitation department, you would be surprised that they run as efficiently as they do. They do generate revenue to support themselves. But we're to the point where we've got to make some capital investments to improve the fleet over there. So the Aldock project. These are the motels, and this is Dunham's. This is going north on 59. <coughs> when we get the next big pretty picture, it will be around about here, around about here, and this road will shift over and line up. Five million dollar project, we've been asked to commit one million dollars to it. The next project is the sewer plant infrastructure. This plant was built way before me. I remember when I was a kid, the sewer plant was at South White. We've come a long way from there. I don't know that we've had a serious write-up in your tenure, have we, Robin? Um, a serious write-up? No. 
Now, that's about unheard of for a plant that handles what they have. During the heyday, when we had all the dye houses going and all the caustic chemicals and all the stuff, what a lot of people don't understand is to get that to the point of reception, we got a lot of miles of pipe, we got a lot of pump stations, we got a lot of things that have to get that stuff there. When it gets there, it has to be put back in the creek cleaner than the creek water. It takes money to do that, and they've done a great job of doing that. But this is actually the creek run by the plant, and that's, that's where it's monitored. They test daily, several times a day, depending on operation. But this plant's got to have some, some upgrades. Nothing like it was years ago, but it's going to have to have some money. So you're looking at a couple of million dollars will disappear real quick when you start fixing stuff over here at what it costs in today's prices. The police department was built, good Lord, in the 40s by wheelbarrows and hand hoed concrete. They built scaffolds around that building. The theater, we all remember the theater. I remember going to movies there. My son got to see E.T. there when he was two years old. And uh, it was a new movie then. That's how, how that goes back. I remember going back and seeing uh, Jerry Lewis as the absent-minded professor, and it was a horror movie to me. I was so young. It was a comedy that scared me. The Doe building was built in 1887. It's one of our oldest standing landmarks. We're fixing to take possession of this year, and it needs some TLC to get it back where it needs to be. The coal and iron building is the heart of our downtown boom days district. We've got the downstairs fixed. It's getting some tremendous use. The upstairs, we want to convert that into teaching art lofts, something that's culturally diverse, you know, teaching studios for all different disciplines. The pool is going to have to have some major upgrades. So all these are going to take money. And like I say, the sports complex itself, we're talking about a vintage 1886 deal that was good as it could be in its time, and it's adequate now, but the sport man won't stay adequate. That's what we got to ask ourselves. So we just want to stay mediocre in some areas because we were great at one time, and we kind of got by and got to the point where we're adequate. So if we want to get better, we got to do that. The police department has glass block windows that leak like everything. This is the jail. We have our own jail. A lot of people don't even understand that Fort Payne has its own jail. 911 is in the basement. The detectives are in this area and the police chief's on the other corner of the building. So this building built in the 40s, it's got to have some major renovations. <coughs> we got to put a new entrance over where the police officers come in and out several times a day. It's been damaged by storms and whatnot. So that building's going to need some TLC. The theater, we all love the theater, but we know this baby right here has got to have some updates. The lights, they work. We're keeping it going. The building looks well for what we're able to do to it, but if we want to make that place a showcase again, it's time to decide how far we want to go. And everything I'm telling you right now is something that we're going to have to price and prioritize. So I'm just giving you the list of things that I'm looking at and we're looking at that we've got to address, and then we're going to have to take those on. The Doe building, the old casket warehouse, it's been called everything time. It was last used as Shire's Hope. We're going to take this part here off, keep the building in the back, and that will be uh, building maintenance. So this building, we hope to return it back to windows where the holes are blocked up. You can go by there and see it's got some structural deals. It's got cables that are literally holding it together. <coughs> That's not something you need to be as nervous about as you think about. It's basically put in there years ago to stabilize things. And depending on how it goes, these were bay doors, and they actually had a fire in there. I've got a picture in one of the landmark books of this actual building on fire. And my father-in-law, who is now 78, rode to that fire with his daddy, who was a fireman, and stood across the street and watched them put the fire out. That building's had several functions over the years. But I think it will be a tremendous asset to us as a historical building to, to bring back our, our, we got so many different military connections in this town. We've got generals that were born and raised here. A lot of people don't understand how many famous people we've got that are from here. And let's showcase them. Color and iron building, like I say, this whole upstairs, we had a kind of a work session walking tour and people were amazed that it's in as good a shape as it is because it was stabilized. Johnny and his crew stabilized the building, addressed the roof first, then we got the outside where it's, 
it's in good shape outside. But if we're going to finish the upstairs, those are some high ceilings, a lot of wiring, a lot of plumbing, a lot of hard work, right, Bo? <laughs> and we want to do that. The pool. This is this is our city pool built on leased property, and then we came back because we didn't have the money to buy it at the time. We leased the property, used some grant money, built the pool, came back in 2002, bought the property, and now it's ours. So this is just three views of it. This is looking west, that's looking east, and this is looking right over the corner where you got the little kitty pool. It's got the big diamond board, the short diamond board, and then it's got the lanes for competition. The building to the right up there is the, the pump house, so to speak. So we got a, we got some issues to address there. Sports complex, like I say, those buildings were built in the 80s. It's time that we're going to spend some money on it. We just got to decide how much we're going to do and when we're going to do it. We definitely want to do it off season. So we're looking at another winter project. So we can't have Buck and his three guys working seven different places. So we've got to prioritize some of these things and see what we're going to do and when we're going to do it. Sanitation, it's hard to see. And this red outline, that's how much property we have at the landfill. Uh, guys went back a few years ago and bought some more property north of there. One issue that we have is we've got some property right here we don't own that we're going to have to own. So we're going to have to buy that in the next few years. But sanitation has got to have some money put back for future expansion, for the footprint expansion, for permitting, for closing the existing road maintenance. Our road commissioner, Johnny, and Red ride the roads every year and get with Tim and they try to prioritize and fix all the roads we can. But the, the problem we have is we got 192 miles of streets in Fort Payne that are ours. That's not counting US 11, which goes all the way through town from one city limit to the other, and 35. Those are both maintained by the state. They are coming in this year to pave from Wave, or, you know, Wave Gap to Whitehall all the way down. To 49th Street. They're going to pave that section. So the big sinkhole, well, all the road, hopefully will get fixed and paved by the state because it's their road. The state is also coming in to mill and patch Galt Avenue where it's sunk in in so many places like 8th Street South and other places. Those are state roads that have to be maintained by them. But we've got 192 miles ourselves that cost $62,000 a mile to pave. We've got a new machine. And the reason it's 62 is because we've got a new machine and Tim can take the error factor out of the old machine and it was $65,000 a mile. Now we can actually do it efficiently and properly and it's 62000 We try to get around five miles a year. We don't put a number on that. We just try to pave everything we can with the money that we have that year. And it averages plus or minus around $300,000. But if we go at the rate we're going, it'll take 38 years to pave every street for paying one time. So some of them have to be paved every 10 years. Some of them will last 38 years. So you have to, again, prioritize it. So then the next thing, we've got improvements that we need to do. Those are our short-term bills. Here's some of our other stuff. The sewer to the northwest Fort Payne, the exit 218 upgrade. I just showed you the picture on The map code. We've talked about purchasing that. We've got a verbal again that they're going to let us buy it, but they haven't told us how much for. So we've got an appraisal coming. We're going to try to purchase the map code. Then we've got a demo, we can clean that lot up and do something with it. So that's going to cost money. The mayor's been working diligently on no hospital. We've got it tested, those samples are off. When we get those reports back, it's kind of crazy in one sense, but the samples got to come back, they got to say it's bad, and then we got to take ownership of it to get money to clean it up. But that's in the works. We don't know how much money we'll get. We don't know how much money it will take. We don't know what the use of that building is going to be. So that is one of the things that's in progress right now. The Cobble building was given to the city at 8th and Galt North. There's been some discussion about turning that into an entrepreneurial center. Uh, there's some interest in doing that. Right now it's shuttered up and we're having to mow the yard and put round up on the grass to keep it from looking so bad. So that's going to have to be addressed. The landfill is going to have to be addressed. That's buying property. The sports complex, my thinking, and I'll show you some pictures in a second on that, we've had the same three soccer fields there since the 80s. We've got over 750 kids playing in the soccer program. We've got little league ball games. 
We've got big ball games. We've got softball games. We've got everybody competing for parking space and playing space up there. So if we can come up with a way that we can build a new standalone soccer complex, I'll show you a second where that could be. Those three soccer fields could then be turned into three more baseball fields and a miracle field, and I'll show you a picture of it. So that's baseball and softball improvements. All of that can be done with a three-phase, three-pronged attack. So we want to increase pay, and we do not want to say, that, hey, we're going to pay 10 miles a year. We're going to pay 12. We can't say that because some roads take more work than others. You may have to rework one before you pay it. So we may have a year where we do eight miles, but it's eight really critical miles. We may have a year we could do 15. We don't know, but we know we've got to increase pay. If we're going to spend a hundred to two hundred thousand dollars on those swimming pool, why don't we look at the possibility of building an aquatic center that would bring in some revenue and bring people in here, and we'll show you some of that stuff. Uh, right now, we don't have basketball. We've got four tennis courts in there at the high school. We've got some at Terrapin Hills, but uh, there's quite a bit of use on those. The military museum, again, the Doe Building, turn that into what it needs to be. And then we've got property over here by Jefferson's that was given to the city that we have to fill and bring it up above flood level so that it can be developed and turned into commercial property. That's estimated at $100,000 just to get it where it's marketable. We want to get a green space. Everybody wants to talk about, hey, we need something to do. If we have a green space, which is basically a biking, hiking, walking trail, Wills Creek would be the ideal place to do that. The Miracle Field is basically a handicapped, accessible ball field. It's set up in the configuration of a t-ball field because it can be used for t-ball. It's basically a concrete field with a rubberized painted finish that people in wheelchairs, walkers, crutches, anybody that has to walk on totally level ground with no trip hazards can play ball on that. They have leads forming up. We can look at that and it can also be used for uh, t-ball. So it's not just a once in a lifetime deal. You can use it however many times a year you need for whatever you need to use it for. We clean up Wills Creek, and I, I say watercraft, watercraft is a canoe, a kayak, a raft, or like us good old boys used to talk about a truck in a tube. But if you can get things for people to do that are entertaining and not destructive, get them to come here and do something. There are a lot of people in Chattanooga and Huntsville that like to go to the mountains. We just branded Fort Payne as Alabama's mountain town. Give them something to do when they get here mountain bike trails. We have enough property at the landfill right now. We actually own from Glenwood Cemetery all the way to the interstate and then north of that ridge. We can put mountain bike trails and hiking trails in the property the city already owns. We don't have to go to the side of the mountain or up the mountain. We can do that later if we need to expand that. But I think we can get enough easements that we could actually at some point in time go all the way from Glenwood Cemetery to uh, Donahoe Chevrolet in those ridges, bypassing the shooting range where nobody gets knocked off their bicycle. But there are logging roads in there already that could be converted fairly easily into trails. You don't have to build a road there. They just need to have something they can ride. I'm not talking about racing bikes. I'm talking about mountain bikes where you ride trails and you walk and you hike and you backpack. Our pre-K program, the Child Resource Network, the, the kids at the Child Development Center deserve better than they're having to be housed in. That's the best we got right now. But that's the old, old high school. And if we can expand things and get things where space opens up, we can move those kids out of the old child development center into a newer facility and improve and enhance that program. So that gives our children you know, additional benefits. Right now we have senior bingo, one, one Wednesday a month. We can expand our programs for senior citizens where we can go weekly. We can have bridge tournaments, whatever. We want to poll the senior citizens and see what they would like to do and give them an activity where they come and meet and we feed them lunch, and they go to the house, and they've met people, they've got out, they've exercised, they've used their mind. Play and scrabble will require some brain work. Anything that you can do to stimulate physical and mental activity is beneficial to senior citizens. And we can do that plus lunch. And it won't cost us that much money. We can, we can put a price tag on it, but I guarantee you we can do it. And we can expand and enhance our schools, which opens up some avenues for some of these other projects. The sewer of Fort Payne on the northwest side, here's where it goes to. Here's where it comes from. This is the sewer plant, way down here at the bottom. This is Fort Payne, running north to south. This is the old earth grains. It's 
sports complex, the school facilities, all up there. There is no sewer other than what you see in blue lines. This blue line goes over to the old DeSoto hosiery, comes down to Dead Man's Curve, and then goes down this blue line and you got pump stations. You got a pump station up here where all sewer here has to be pumped up here, comes down here out, comes over to the airport to another pump station where it's pumped again. These are called force mains, which means they have sewer under pressure. You just can't go out there and tie into that and put a pipe in, can you, Rob? That no. makes a terrible mess. No. Those pipes were literally so worn out years ago during the heyday of the, <coughs> of the sock business that some of them are paper thin. The reason they're still working is because the load is down on them. So in 2002, Johnny and his crew did a study and had this plan developed. These are all gravity sewer lines, which is the way you want to go. You want it to go downhill with just the flow of water and not have to pump it. It was done in four phases. The first one was down here from the sail barn to the plant. The next one was from the sail barn up to the airport. The next one was from the airport up to Dead Man's Curve. And these <coughs> all ran Wills Creek because if water run downhill, other stuff will too. So you make it a gravity system. Take these pump stations out of the mix, save a bunch of money annually on that process. So all of these were done, and these were priced. This phase is totally new. This is from Dead Man's Curve up Wills Creek, out the new 49th Street to the pump station at Earth Cranks. If you put this in, that's an all-gravity line. It would accommodate Terrapin Hills Lagoon, take it out of a deal where it's basically having to treat the affluent at Terrapin Hills, 167 and there about households, and then it goes back into the creek. There's some issues there. That's a private system, but that's the best they got. You put this gravity system in, you open up this whole part of Fort Payne to develop residential, commercial, whatever. There is no sewer there. I, saw that. I hope everybody understands. There's no sewer anywhere in here. It's just Terrapin Hills down to a lagoon. So you put that in, and these have been priced out to get the most bang for the buck is to run sewer where there is none. So that project in itself is $6.8 million. So if you do a $10 million bond issue, you put this sewer up here and that gives you a little over $2 million, a little over three, depending on what it works out, to go to the sewer plant for upgrades. So that's all done in one fell swoop. We've got a bond payment right now of $750. Eight, they're about thousand dollars a year. It pays out next year. If you get ten million dollars of sewer bond money, it's paid for out of the sewer fund, not the general fund. That payment would drop to five hundred fifty thousand dollars. So we would cut two hundred thousand dollars off the burden of the sewer fund to pay that bond, fix a lot of stuff, cut some costs down. So there's ten million dollars you need, but it's going to cost you half a million dollars that we don't have right now. In one more year, we're going to pay that bond off. We can set this up where the next year that payment comes to you. So we do all this sewer work right here and basically save $200,000 a year after next year. So that's one option. Right. 218, like I said, $5 million project. They ain't going to do it if we don't give them some money. We're done trying to negotiate, but they want a million dollars. Johnny Alton said it would be. But they held firm on the million dollars. So we're going to do that. That is going to be so beneficial to Fort Payne, you won't imagine the, the effect when it's overdone. The map code, we've got to buy it and we've got to get rid of it. That's going to cost money. We've got to assign a value to that. The old hospital, that's going to cost money. We don't know how much on us, how much on the federal government. We just don't know. That's an unknown entity. But we've got to be in a position to do that when the time comes. So that's got to be assessed of value. The Cobble Building, if we put that into private ownership, that's off our books and we're good. But we just want to make sure it goes into private ownership and the shutters come off and it goes back into be a viable building again. We don't want to stay shuttered up on Galt Avenue, three blocks north of our historic district. That's still our historic district as far as I'm concerned. The landfill, we've got to buy this piece of property and this piece of property. We don't know what that's going to cost. We'll leave that up to our attorney. Uh, we've tried to buy for several years, it just was not for sale. But we've got to have that to move these holding ponds over here, up here. Because 
our runoff will go north instead of south. So we've got to have it. We own all this property here. We may be able to get some options and some easements on some of this. So we've got the property to expand our landfill now, other than these two pieces of property. So that's a value we're going to have to assign. This porch complex. Currently as it sits, here's the old earth grains. Here's our three little ball fields, our park air, our big softball, and these three soccer fields. That's our soccer, that's our soccer, baseball, t-ball, softball complex. That we've got. That's our multi-purpose complex as it stands today. This is it in a wider picture, but if you'll see, we have to own this property right here. And it's kind of funny, we built this on leased property. Then we had to go buy this property give it to earth grains for the deed to this property. Then we got it back. So now we own this and this. We did own this and we just got paid off for it this year. So that's the money that's been coming in that's not going to come in anymore. So we own this nice hay field. Sorry about it, but We own this nice hay field right here. This is a wetland which can't be built in or disturbed. This is a spring up here that comes down through here that can be routed down this way. This would be a tremendous soccer complex. It's still in driving distance and walking distance of the old soccer complex, but if you can get these three fields here, how many can you get in here? We may be possibly uh, put a full size high school competition size field in. We don't know. You make this a soccer complex, expand that uh, ability for the kids to do things there. Pee Wee football, we have 150 kids, uh, boys and girls. We got a lot of cheerleaders that think as much Pee Wee football as the boys do. They don't even have a bathroom to go to when they practice now. They have to go to the high school concession stand or the mouth code and use the restroom when they practice. So we, we want to address that. So, you know, there's there are nearly a thousand kids just playing soccer and peewee football that could benefit from this property being turned into a full-fledged peewee football soccer complex. Once that's completed, these turn into three or four more fields, depending on what you size, what size you put on, and how big you make them, and how you want to go with that. So, if you're going to expand something, here's a bigger picture of that property. Uh, this property could possibly be acquired from Oval Stratton's parent company, which would square that off. But this whole piece, of that's roughly 1,500 to 500 feet of usable space, not counting the slopes and the spring and whatnot. So that would be right across the street from what's projected as the new elementary school. They go hand in hand. If there's construction done over here and they have excess material that they need to remove, it'd be nicely removed right across the street. Working hand in hand, partnering with our other entities. Increased paving, uh, that's about all you can say. We need to increase paving. The aquatic center. We've got a nice field that was uh, developed just north of the rec center. It's got four backstops, primarily used for practice for soccer and stuff now. You build a nice aquatic center there, and I'm talking about an aquatic center, a new outdoor pool, a full-fledged water park, not a splash pad, but a water park, and these, if you want to go on the internet and Google up Cullen, this is theirs. They have since added another big slide over here. That brings in $175,000 a year. It gives people a lot of things. It, it takes everything from little kids to adults. And here's my thinking. If kids will drive from Adairsville, Georgia to get killed out here in the canyon doing risky stuff, let them come down here and slide one of these 60-foot slides for a few dollars and eat a hamburger town before they leave. It's safer for them and it takes work off the rescue people. People will come to this. Coleman's is right up the road from Spring Valley Beach in Bluntsville. It's rated as the number two water park in Alabama, and it's within 30 minutes of Coleman's, and it still brings in there to $200,000 a year. This is not a splash pad. This is a water park. This is a big bucket that comes down and dumps on a thing, and it just <coughs> sprays water everywhere, so nobody gets knocked down by the force So even little kids can play in here. It's got playground equipment in the water. It's got a little lazy river. This is another one. I'm just showing some examples here of the slide configurations that you can get. Some of these are in very rural areas on just basically what was a city pool and they bought a slide and put on it. So if you're going to build an aquatic center, build an aquatic center. That would have to be priced and prioritized. 
our basketball and tennis complex, we don't have one. We don't have an outdoor basketball venue right now. We have very few indoor basketball venues other than the rec center. The school kids play and the school gyms and whatnot. This is our four tennis courts that we have, and they're all to high school. And I went and looked at them the other day. They're in pretty good shape, but they need some improvement, but they need some more tennis courts. So if you're going to build something, if you're going to build an aquatic center up at Wills Valley, then take the old pool, turn that into your basketball tennis complex. Maybe. We own all the property. We can do some configuring over there. It's off the main track. It's in the center of town. So you've got basketball potential. You've got restrooms and concessions down there if you wanted to do something. So that's already in place. So make that some tennis courts and basketball facilities there. Our military museum, we did this for the mayor because he wants to put a tank at Patriot Park. Our military museum would be the Doe Building. We can't get that in there, it'd be across the street. But if you've got Patriots Park, it's basically designed to honor every Patriot, which is military, fire, police, EMS, everybody that's considered a Patriot, what would be better than to go right across the street into our 1887 vintage military museum that's got stuff from the Revolutionary War, Civil War, anything that anybody here's got a tie to. People can literally bring you things to put in that museum and you receive it in much like the depot does. And you can have Grandpa's uniform from World War I on display properly in a climate control bill. Jefferson's property, this is Jefferson's right here. We have this whole piece of property right here but this is a creek, so it's got to be brought up to a level where you can develop that. That's roughly $100,000 just to get it where you can build on it. Green space. That's how simple it can be. Something that people can ride a bike on, walk on, push a baby carriage on, jog, no motorized vehicles, no dirt bikes, no four-wheelers, none of that. They can go ride somewhere else. We're talking about passive Easy going, laid back recreation. Wills Creek would be the ideal place to do that. The Miracle Field that I talked about, this is an overhead shot of one. Huntsville just built one, there's several in Alabama. But this is basically just a concrete, rubberized, painted, finished t ball field that has no trip hazards. Can you imagine that in Fort Payne? And right out here outside the outfield fence was a totally handicapped, accessible playground which means all kids can use it. We have some playground equipment in City Park, thanks to Game Time and City and some clubs partnered up, but we've just got a few pieces there. If you built that whole thing handicapped accessible, kids smaller, they don't know what's handicapped accessible, they just know they can play on it. If handicapped kids can play on it, any kid can play on it. So that and be seniors. Good. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Senior citizens can actually walk up instead of having to go upstairs. But this is something that's, that's near to my heart. The Miracle League is formed up, and they actually have leagues where people, and this is not just children, this is adults. We all know adults who are handicapped, who are challenged, that need something to do to get out. And uh, you, you can go back to the CBS News last week, a guy in San Antonio built a whole water park for handicapped kids because his daughter could not speak. I don't know if she had some form of autism or what. But she went to a birthday party at a, at a swimming pool, and the kids had nothing to do with her. And he said this, the look in her eye broke his heart. That she, she was like, what's wrong with me? She couldn't tell him that, but it broke his heart. And he built an $18 million water park for handicapped people. And to see those kids riding around in wheelchairs and the splash pads and stuff like that, it, it'll warm your heart. But if you'll take care of the least of these, they'll take care of you. Wills Creek, that's how much through our valley Wills Creek encompasses. It, it runs from north to south, folks. We all know it comes through here, but a lot of people don't know how many zigs and zags it makes. It's perfect for canoeing and kayaking, but you can't get through it in some places because of the debris and things like that. Two things here. If you clean it out, it gets the waters out of the valley quicker, makes it safer, cuts our flooding down. You also make it a navigable waterway so people can canoe, they can raft, they can kayak, whatever. And this, if you want to look at a close up of this, I've got some. But that's how much that creek affects our, our community here. If we go to the prospect of doing this gravity sewer line, 
you get the easements along the sewer to do the sewer line, you put your green space walking trail on the same property. Once the sewer line is buried and covered up, you basically put an eight foot wide road down through there so that people can inspect the sewer line and see what's going on. And you close off the entrances where people can only get on it with bicycles or things like that. And you've got your green space. Mountain bike trails. Doesn't seem to be a big priority for a lot of people, but for the people that's priority to, it's one of the biggest ones I have. It doesn't have to be a mountain bike trail. It just needs to be a trail that's suitable for mountain bikes. And if you ride a bicycle on it, you can hike on it. And we've got as much elevation in this ridge complex over here as the side of the mountain. Some of these ridges are steeper than the side of the mountain. So we own that property. We could work out property owners, hopefully give us easements to take that further north if we needed to. You can actually go to the cemetery, go over the ridge, and get into this bike and hiking complex. This is a little bigger context. This is the FOP shooting range right here. So you say we go there. But if you stay up here and skirt the top of the ridge, you could eventually come out of Donahue Chevrolet and never see a vehicle. Like I say, the Child Development Center is in the old, old high school. We need to do better than that. Our seniors, this is just a canned photograph, but our seniors need one Wednesday a month to play bingo and have lunch, have a good time, a lot of bring covered dishes. If you do that once a month, we can expand that to once a week. Every Wednesday could be senior day. Then they go to the store and get all the sales. Our schools, this is our newest school, it's 20 years old. Mr. Cunningham can address any issues that we have about that. It was built in the conjunction with the city. The city partnered with the schools in 1997. We built the rec center, they built schools, they touched, they physically joined. That's the gym for the school, but we're paying for it. Nothing wrong with that. We've been paying for it for 20 years, it's been a good arrangement. So we can help do things like that. We've done it in the past, we'll do it again. This is my propaganda stuff. We're in a position to move to the next level for our community, and our is all of us. We heard all these ideas and requests last year. We can improve full pain. That's what we promised we'd do, and it's time to do that. But to go forward, we've got to have more revenue that's coming in now. That's the bottom line. The last sales tax increase was 1984. A one penny sales tax increase in Fort Payne right now will bring us to everybody else around us and will generate approximately $2.8 million at current levels. That funding can be allocated as we see fit as a body to do any or all of these projects and anything else we need to do. We just don't have it to do right now. This is a long range plan, but it would have short term results. You would see immediate results within a year on some of these plans. Our complex was built in 86. The pool was built about the same time. Then we had to go back and buy them in 2000 and 2002. Our new rec center is 20 years old. Our new rec center. Our major capital improvements over the last 30 years have all been funded by bonds. That's the way to go. That's the best way to go. Best use of money. We do all these projects in that same way with bond money. But we have to have money to make those bond payments. Our infrastructure needs upgrades. We need more money for commercial development. We need more money to be competitive as an industrial recruiter. We have $212,000 in our industrial development fund to go out and try to hook somebody. That's not going to do much in this day and time. In 1967, our parents and grandparents made a bold decision and they got a property tax to fund the school system in Fort Payne. Thirty years later, they came back and overwhelmingly kept it in place. And it's what's funding our school system today. They did a seven and a half mil property tax. We're just only talking about a penny right now. And by the way, a mill of property tax, to show you the diversity of some communities, a mill in Fort Payne, the last date I had was $162,000. In Coleman, it's two hundred and eighty. dollars That's the difference in communities. So if you want to know why some communities have more money than others, it's because of disparities like that. If you can improve the quality of life for every <coughs> Build things that will make people want to come to this community, improve safety, health, and education, and give your community the great majority of things that they long for, then why wouldn't you? 
you can do all this by raising the tax just to the level of the people around us. We're not going ahead of anybody. We're just catching up. Talladega's at five cents. We're talking about going to four. Ozark is at four. Alexander City's four. Cullen is a half a cent city sales tax. But guess what? The county collects three and a half cents for them and they get $17 million in revenue on four. So everything's got an asterisk. You've got to dig to find out the back story. Scottsboro has three cents. Jackson County collects two cents and gives a third of that money to the Scottsboro School Board and in turn gives $1.4 million to the Scottsboro City to pay the bonds that they floated to pay for the school. Hartzell's at four. Jerry Gardendale's at four. <coughs> Sarah Land's four and a half. You file is four. Pell City's at five. And then you see the little asterisk down here. We're talking about going to four. That would take us to nine cents, which is where Rangeville's been for years. I'm not talking about leapfrogging anybody. I'm talking about catching up and moving our city forward, and we've got to make that decision as a group of how far we want to go. So we can prove full pain. This will allow us to do all of these projects. We can prioritize those and do the ones we need to do as soon as we need to do them. But it also allows us to partner with the school system where they need to do some major overhaul and innovation. Their money's tied up until 2026 on the bond issue. They can't get any more money right now on property tax without voting for a new property tax. The climate's not there for that. Nobody around us has approved that lately. People just don't want to improve the quality of life by having to pay another $30 a year property tax. It's just not going to happen in most communities. But this penny's not going to hurt anybody. And I've heard the arguments of, okay, you're going to find sales tax and give all the money to schools. No. I just went through an hour of city projects that need to be funded and done if we're going to move to the next level in our community. When we get to the point of discussing things with schools, Mr. Cunningham and his group have a program and they have a proposal for us on how they want to address certain things. If they're going to do anything to improve, we're going to have to fund that. We're going to have to fund that some way and it can be part of the sales tax. And I say a part. You can't commit money you don't have yet and you can't commit all of this right now and hope that it stays good. You have to be very conservative of this, but we've got some plans in place where we can do spot things. We can do $5 million increments of bonds if we need to. We don't have to go borrow $50 million, which this penny would fund. I'm not talking about borrowing $50 million in bond money and pay for it with this $2.8 million that a penny will fund. That gives us nothing to keep the city going forward or raise us. Like I said, the city payrolls about a half a million dollars every two weeks. Those people want a raise every now and then. They deserve a raise every now and then. We can't commit so much of this money to other things that we can't take care of our citizens and our employees. This will take care of everybody. We just have to decide as a group how we're going to prioritize that and what we're going to do and, and what way we're going to go. So we all talked about let's move full pain forward last year. It's time to move full pain forward. wondered if anyone else had questions or anything kind of before um, we move forward. I, I do have someone here that um, I just kind of like to, to speak to some things, but I think that you guys should be given the floor first. Jim, do you want to address some of the stuff I've talked about? I, I just briefly alluded to the schools having a plan. Their, their plan is basically a multi-step approach and they're going to prioritize what they think they need to do to come to us to put that plan forward because we have to partner with them or this doesn't happen. We decide whether it goes forward or not. If we don't do this, nothing's going forward. We're just going to stay where we are. So I'm not for passing a sales tax to build a new school. I'm for passing a penny sales tax to catch up with everybody around us, do the things that our people deserve, and help schools. Fair enough. Would you like me to? Sure. You want to come up here? You can I tender the microphone. Okay. Cutting out. Oh, I will need the microphone. The meanest 160 pound guard I ever had to get. Jim, you want to? 
amazed at what some of the times all heard. Great job. Thanks for inviting us today. Council, Mayor, Mayor, I have you a packet up here. I thought I'd been promoted. <laughs> Well, if you got that, I'll just come up and sit down. How about that? We do have a few things we'd like to mention. First, thanks for having us. And thanks all for all you do for us. Uh, we have, as you know, four student buildings. And Mr. Hill mentioned that our facilities are aging. I just want to make you aware of the age of the schools, too, because there's a shelf life on those buildings. Wills Valley Elementary School is our new school. We're proud of it. It's a 1998 new school, and we're in 2017. Now, our job is not to just keep the building and keep school we want to keep the building up and we try to do the best we can if you walk through it we carry people through that thing still today and they say well this is like a new building we want to take care of it we also appreciate the uh, you partnering with us allowing us to use the rec center for uh, physical education and also basketball practice that, that's a great partnership and forward thinking for that to happen it's, it's wonderful for the city of Fort Payne and for the students of Fort Payne Fort Payne Middle School, we don't think of that as an old building, but it's a 1988 model, 29 years old. Williams Avenue Elementary School. Now, I'm going to date some people. How many of you attended Williams Avenue? About everybody in here. And there's a good chance most of your parents also attended uh, Williams Avenue. And it was built in 1954. Now that's the older part of the building, which is 63 years old. Now we've had additions to it. In 69, we have a library. In 76, we put in a, the old junior high addition. In 95, we put the additions at the north end of the building, but still the main building is 63 years old. We've worked hard to keep that thing up. But that, those 63 years has had a lot of traffic. So it's not the most attractive facility we have by any means. Something we need to address. I mean, Fort Payne High School, we used to call it the new high school. Do you remember that? Well, the new high school is a 69 model. So it's 48 years old. And I will date myself. I was in the first freshman class to go for a full year at Fort Payne High School. So it's been around for a while, but we keep that thing up too. But here's our problem. Right now, Wills Valley, we have pre-K, and you know we have five of those now, and we go all the way through second grade. We have 786 students there. At Williams Avenue is just um, third and fourth grade. We have 509 students. Fort Payne Middle School is fifth through eighth grade, 987 students. This year we're going to go over 1,000. At Fort Payne High School this past year we have 923, and the number looks closer to 950 this time. Last year, our total enrollment was 3,205 students. Now, that's not a huge school system, but for a city system, we're a 6A school system. It's a lot of students. I'm telling you that to tell you we've got one really old school, actually two really old schools, but one tremendously old, and we have students in every classroom in every building. Our graduation rate, I just want to give you some things, some points of pride. You hear graduation rate all the time. Are we getting kids through school? Are they getting a proper education? In 2012, 2013, it's 91%. But for the from 2013 to 2017, it's been 97% or greater graduating. We're proud of that. College and career ready standards, which are kids that are have passed the work keys, or they've met the ACT benchmarks, or they have industrial certifications, or approved college credit, or enlistment into a branch of military. This past year we were at 91%, which is outstanding. It's 91.2%. Industry credentials, we've gone up the past two years and we had 88 students receive uh, industry credentials, which is workforce development. 
uh, Fort Payne High School total scholarships. Do you come to the scholarship presentations? Uh, you'd be amazed to see this. In 2012, we had uh, 73 students received a little over $2 million in scholarships. Last year, this past year, we had 92 seniors out of 206 received $5,267,000 in scholarships. So we've really gone up trying to do a better job. And we're, our folks do a fantastic job. Technology advancements, you got a big part of it. In 2008 you did. Promethean boards, we'll put them in every classroom. Unheard of. We're one of the few in the nation. In fact, some say we were the first. There's a dispute on whether we were the first, second, or third, but that's fantastic. We put classroom sound systems in every classroom. We put document cameras in all our classrooms. In 2013-2014, we provided iPads for all students at Fort Payne High School. We thought we'd arrived. The next year, we gave all the middle school iPads. So now we're half all the kids in the city school system have iPads. In 2015-2016, all the students that we examined here got an iPad. And in 2016-2017, we took the iPads from the high school and moved them to pre-K through two. Even a pre-K student, every one of them has their own iPad. And all the high school students got a Chromebook. So as far as technology and technology in the classroom, there's nobody better than us. We have internet access throughout, high speed internet access, wireless access throughout all our schools. We've put in a career tech education, agriculture, food and natural resources, architecture and construction, arts and uh, AV technology, business management and administration. And I'm, I'm sorry, Jessica, I'm not telling you to go through this. I'm just, you know, I'm just going as fast as I can, okay? Education and training, government and public administration, health science, hospitality and tourism, law and public safety and corrections and security, project lead the way in engineering. All this sounds just like the day you were in high school a little bit. You had all those opportunities, didn't you, Andy? Don't you remember when you were in the engineering class, Project Lead the Way? No. None of this was available. I this is, Andy didn't remember any of it. <laughs> this has happened in very recent years, and we're proud of it. And I know you're proud of it because it's your school system. We've been able to have academic initiatives. And, and Jessica, if you'll back up, back, back, keep going back, I want them to see this. Again, we're one-to-one -one iPads. We're fully digital classrooms. We compete in best robotics. We have the state champion for the past five years in the real world design team that has represented us in Washington three years. We have, we have rocketry competition teams, both at the middle and high school. We have Rube Goldberg competition teams, and that's physics teams, and this was our first year of being that, and we won the state. We went on to the international competition in that. We have dual enrollment courses. You can't imagine how much, co how many college courses you can leave Fort Payne High School with, with our partnership with Northeast and JSU. So we're really proud of what, what we can offer our students. We have Lego robotics teams that compete everywhere. In fact, we were just in an, another international competition in Arkansas this summer with the middle school robotics team. We have culinary competitive teams. We have our own TV station, and our own TV production, and those guys competed again, national competition this time in Kentucky. We help health science competitive teams. We competed in national, international competition again in Florida this time. Um, we have tech teams at Williams Avenue, Fort Payne Middle School, and Fort Payne High School. We have drama teams. The list just goes on and on. And I'm not talking about the thing. I'm talking about things that are over and above what you usually see. Of course, we have every kind of sport you can imagine, except ice hockey and waiter. I'm not going to mention that. We don't want to go to ice hockey. But in saying that, we have needs. And gentlemen, you have something, and it's option one. And Jessica, I don't know if this is working for you, if you can find option one on there or not, but option one talks about a new elementary school. If you're aware, we just bought approximately 55 acres across from the old Miracle building. Has and that property been purchased? Yes. Y'all have the deed on The deed's on my desk. It's 
Civil War property. We're looking for 750 students or so to go to a new school there if we decide that move Williams Avenue. We'd like to change Williams as a grade three through four student now. We'd like to go three through five. This would take the fifth grade away from the middle school, move it to the new school. This would free up Williams Avenue to still be used. And again, it could be used for pre-K. It can help with those child development children that you're talking about, any dual enrollment uh, possibilities we might bring from colleges. It's, it's, it opens up all kinds of things that could happen at Williams Avenue. But with this new elementary school, it would house 750 students, have 40 classrooms, grades three through five, a PEGM cafeteria, media center, administration. This is the scary part. Now, when you get to schools, you talk about big buildings. The projection from the architects is that's around an $18 million school. They don't give schools away. But we need, we need a new school, we need the room. We would also propose that we have a new high school competition, Jim Moore High School, that would seat 1,600 in an arena-style seat, uh, seating in the, in, the, in the round, which means we'd have seats all around the floor. We'd have walker rooms, related spaces, parking and driving. That budget to do that, and, and that was really in the original plan, was an auditorium, but this would be even more than an auditorium, is around six and a half million dollars. But that would sit, and by the park, on the parking lot adjacent to the high school office and in front of the gym, which means we would have to move our parking down to where the band practice field is and where the tennis court is. So it helps us to hear that we would have tennis court possibilities at another area. Those parking is going to be printed. Uh, I did put on there a cost for tennis courts, new construction of a tech building. We really think that as we look at what we could do, I continue to hear we have a shortage of future plumbers, electricians, machinists, uh, welders. We'd like to have a building that would house that type of uh, instruction, where we're looking at uh, drywall construction, the whole nine yards of building a house or, or, or helping with contractors find people that could work for them. And we have students that are, are willing and capable of learning that, that trade. We just don't have a place for it. So it would be great to have that there. And that, that projected cost of around 700000 And we could open that up at night if the city wanted to have a program for citizens at night. They'd more than glad to have training going on for the same thing there. New park, uh, parking and driveway, in other words, our driveways are bad. You mentioned the streets are bad. Let me look at our driveways. Our parking lots are terrible, and it's very expensive to fix them, and we're going to need more. Uh, that is a big dollar, big ticket price, as you see. But we need more parking at Wills Valley. We need parking at the middle school. And we need parking at the high school. And Tim, this, is going to, this sounds like a bunch, but you know how it really it, uh, parking, uh, paving each step the money. It's around a $2 million projection. And then our press box at the stadium, we, we put that in for a reason. We have a beautiful stadium. It's probably in the prettiest setting you can imagine for a, a Friday night event or a graduation. But if you go to our press box, you're going to see restrooms that'll house uh, around one person at a time. One, well, actually two. One in the one female, one male, and that's really not enough. We need to make that more presentable for a city of Fort Payne and uh, for our visitors. And this is actually on our home side. We just, we need to uh, renovate our press box. If we did that, in looking at the monies we were talking about. You're, you're close to 32, 35 million dollars. Would it make a huge difference? Yes. I was also asked, would it not be better if we didn't just build a high school on the new land, move everybody at the middle school to the high school, move everybody from Williams Avenue to the to um, um, Fort Payne Middle School, and have room expansion for all areas? Yeah. Now that is a that would be fantastic. So I got a price tag on that, 53 million. Now you were talking about money though, and, and the penny does add up to a lot of money. 
if it's leveraged. I feel like to do everything Wade would like to do and also, or you would like to do, and, and looking at our needs, probably the option one would be what we'd have to look at and look at the school part of it first. But on, on the high school, we have to keep in mind in 2026, when the property tax comes up for renewal, we need to be prepared at that time to support the renewal because we know our high school is a 1969 model. And I think we probably need to look at what Albert was done and the, the places that have built a high school on the footprint they already have. And, and that takes a little more time, but we have a perfect location for a high school now where it is. So that's just some thoughts I wanted to share with you. Uh, also in your package, you have a few diagrams of, of what we'd like to do. Is there any questions on the needs of our city school system? Well, thank you for listening. And I, I'm really excited. These are true needs. Uh, we want to offer our students the best we can, the best education possible in a safe facility. and. Um, this would help us do that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jimmy. Is anybody else from the audience? Would anybody else like to uh, address the council? Any concerns? Jimmy? I'd just like to say uh, I've been in Fort Payne a long time, but this is the, one of the closest we've had to a strategic plan for the city of Fort Payne that I know of. And uh, I think Wade's done an outstanding job on this and with y'all's input. And uh, I do think this is a footprint that we can follow, you know, to make Fort Payne a greater city. And I just think y'all did a great job. And hopefully the citizens of Fort Payne will support y'all 100%. Well, we, we hope so. Uh, what I wanted to get in this meeting was let's put everything out here on the table. If we're going to talk about something, I did not want anybody to come back later on and say, oh, this is a ruse. To get some money to fix city streets and pave some roads, and down the road a month, y'all come in here and ask for some money. I, I, I don't want anybody to think for one minute that we're trying to hide anything. I think anybody that knows us knows we're as transparent as anybody that's ever been here. We're not wax paper, we're saran wrap. We want everybody to understand what's out there and what's on the table. We understand that the city has partnered with the schools before. I think we want to partner with the schools in the future. But knowing what you need and a relative price tag gives us the ability to prioritize those things. And it may be a, a little here and a little there. But we know where we're going forward. And we know about what time frame we can do certain things. So I just wanted to address one thing and leave you with this. When you talk about a one penny sales tax, you're talking about a dollar a hundred. It's not going to kill anybody. The two most affected groups of people are your senior citizens on fixed income and your low income multi-household families. So here's just a couple examples. Senior citizens, I'll take that first because they're near to my heart. If you have a person on Social Security and they're drawing $800 a month and they spend their whole check at Bruce's Foodland, they're going to spend eight more dollars. But they're not going to spend that whole check. They're going to have some other things. But just their whole check would be eight more dollars going to that tax. For that, we could offer them a Wednesday lunch, every Wednesday, if they want. If they can't come and take advantage of that, the Council on Aging serves lunch every day at 11, five days a week to anybody who come and get it. If you can't come and get it, they'll bring it to you, Meals on Wheels, and a lot of you people in here are in clubs that go deliver those. Only 20 to 25 people a day take advantage of that program. If you're on fixed income in Fort Payne, if you have Social Security or disability, you can get free garbage pickup. That will save you $15 a month right there. That's twice what you would pay in that tax increase. If you're on sewer, you can save up to $14.96 on that. That's $30 a month. You can make $22 a month on this deal if you'll just support us in it, if you're in the right configuration. And everybody wins. The low-income households, we hear about the kids, oh my lord, we got all these people that are on reduced and free lunches. That's a program we have no control of. People fill out those applications and they get those meals and there's nothing we can do about it. But I think last year's number, 62%, I think, is what had a reduced or a free lunch. You can qualify for a reduced lunch at $45,000 a year household income. Just because you qualify don't mean you need to take advantage of it, but a lot of people do. 
one demographic in that 62%, half of it to be exact, is 98% free or reduced. So you take that out of the mix and we're around 30 some percent. So it's not a crisis of kids going hungry around here and it's not a crisis of our senior citizens going to do with that. We can address <coughs> anybody's needs when this program gets in place. We just got to figure out if we're going to do this, when we're going to do it, and uh, how we want to prioritize things when we get to that point. So. We've got a council meeting next week, and I would like Brian to be able to put on the agenda for us to at least have an ordinance to look at and make a decision if we're going to go forward, and we can decide at that time if we're going to address this issue or we're going to just back it off and stay where we're at. So I think it's, it's time to put up or shut up. People told me to go fix things. I'm here to try to fix things. We all said we'd move Fort Payne forward. We're doing okay, but we deserve better, and we can do better. Okay, could you clarify real quickly and tell us how, what percent sales tax that Fort Payne receives from the county? We get none. Exactly. None. Right. They get one cent, we get none of that. That's and about I, five million dollars a year right. that goes, most of it out, nearly three of that goes out of Fort Payne and none comes back. Now I'm not going to beat up on the county commission, some of my friends and one I'm running, but they get a penny. They've got the ability to take another penny. If okay. we don't take a penny, we need to take a penny. We need to do it now. We need to put it to work. We can come back anytime in the future and prioritize every one of these things. We can do some city stuff. If the school needs this over here, we're, I'm not saying let's go give $30 million to the schools. I'm not for that. I'm for let's fund the schools as best we can and do what we need to do to make them better, which makes us better. Okay. So. Sorry to cut you off because I just want to talk a little bit. Go ahead. <laughs> I mean, and honestly, I respect Jimmy Cunningham. We've been friends forever. And if he says we need a new school, I mean, I believe you. And I look at these figures and I look back at just the scholarship totals you're telling me in the last five years. That's almost $20,000 that our school has generated that the parents in Fort Payne have not had to pay. That's investment back into our community. And that then it's felt self would almost pay for a school in the last five years so I commend you on that um, the thing is along with that you said you have just over two three thousand students you know we represent close to 15,000 citizens and so um, for us to have a sales tax increase and do the things we want to do I think we should have a strategic plan and commit to that and um, break these things down in doable steps and, and plan it and plan it wisely and have everyone on the same page. I met a gentleman through Main Street. Uh, his name is Tony Renta. Uh, he, he, he does those sorts of things, but he's already invested uh, time with Fort Payne over the last three years and done some visioning as far as downtown, but also overall with Fort Payne. And I would just like for him to come up real quickly, if you could, Tony, and just speak to the importance of having this strategic plan. He is uh, an expert in urban development and um, he also can work with us and tell us what grant monies are out there and how we can apply them and how we can best do this, not only with the money we have, but the grant opportunities that are out there. And I think that's so important as we move forward. We can't discount that. We need someone telling us how we can do, put all these pieces together and, and do it in the best informative way. And so, hit it, Tony. Hey, I'm uh, Tony Rento with Rancho Urban Land Design out of Birmingham. Uh, the plan was wonderful. I mean, you identify all your needs, who needs it, why they need it, ways to come about funding. What we did, and actually, you talked about a lot of our projects up there about knowing it. We worked with the city of Golden and doing the same thing. We worked with their park and rec for about five years. We worked with their city, and then recently this past year, we've been hired by the city to do their strategic plan, where we met with the school board as one group, the Chamber of Commerce, the city staff, the Economic Development Board, and the Industrial Development Board. And we took all the same outline that you have and prioritized them based off of 
the priorities for each one of those uses, and then we met with them as a group to figure out how they could share resources. So phase one for the school might not be phase one for the city, but something the city's doing could overlap with what the school's doing, so both of them can happen a lot sooner. So for example, we're working with Prattville right now on their sewer treatment facility. And there's a grant out there by ADM that pays you 50 cents back on the dollar if there are things done with green infrastructure. All the way down to the parking, the landscape, the building. They're not saying leave, just green infrastructure. And it's a it's a payback. It's not a it's not a tip, it's not a bond, it's not a fine. They actually give you the money back and we show you spend it. That's 50 cents on the dollars that can get toward another project. Uh, we are working with the city of Coleman on a citywide and now countywide greenway plan. And when we got involved, we were really concerned about the infrastructure throughout the city. Every couple of years, they're using TAP funds, transportation enhancement funds, to improve some of their downtown blocks. So every two years, they're putting about half a million dollars into two to three blocks of redevelopment. And they're wanting to do the Greenway on top of it, but we were able to find out that if we could do them both together and overlap the Greenway on top of the infrastructure improvement plan, everybody won. There's more federal funds involved with that. So now the TAP funds are, over, are getting into safe school with routes funds, some other ADM and core funds. There's a lot of those things, and I love the sewer plan and Mill Creek. Those can all overlap with each other, so maybe that priority might jump up because there's revenue source tied to it. Again, we work at Coleman, so we work at the Aquatic Center, we know what their future plans are, they have some other stuff coming out in the next year and a half. We'll see more revenue coming in there. Those facilities also took strain off of other facilities they have. So their police, fire, city employees, everybody gets to use their Aquatic Center as their rec center as well. So they're taking strain off other buildings or other pieces of buildings that might have been renovated or expanded based off of use or growth. Say, for example, growth in the police department. They can have space in the existing police department if they take their gym away and they all get to go to the aquatic center. And because firemen and police have different hours, they get different access to the center. So, it, it, I mean, there's a lot of things here that we're hearing. I, I, love, I really did love the plan. I think there's a lot to be done uh, between Main Street, Park and Rec, the school and the city. I think the, the thing to do from the city side, this is why they wanted us to come up and meet. And I didn't know this is what it was going to be. I thought it was going to be like a little small closed door, just brainstorm on some things. I think if you can get that plan into more of a strategic plan that talks about which one of those funding sources are, which a lot of it's been done, especially with the school and the sewer, and figure out if you can find revenue from some of those earlier phases that pay for later phases and prioritize it that, prioritize it that way. So maybe you don't have to borrow as much on the bond, if at all. And then we can bring in, we got two grant riders in North Alabama, one in the Shoals, one in the hospital, that can, we can sit down with that strategic plan and say, here's what we got, here's what we need, how can we do it? Because the LDOT plan, that's their 80-20 typical match. When you're talking about that $1 million, that's their typical 80-20 match. But you can tie other things into it that might get funded through that same improvement plan that might go a little further than those intersections if you can get them. But now's the time to, I mean, if you look at it all at 30,000 feet, you probably find a lot of overlap where you can save some time and money and get all the different groups in the city working together to do so. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so, thank so much, Tom, for coming. I think it's uh, great that, that he worked with Coleman a lot. And we hear a lot about Coleman. Uh, it, it kind of mirrors what what we could do. Uh, I think we could have our own Coleman right here at Full Paint. Make sure we've got Tony's number. Oh, i got Tony's number on speed dial. Yeah, he's he's right here. 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 Right I don't know how anyone can look at this and this presentation way to get was, I mean, it's unbelievable. I mean, in serious, we need this. And we don't need it for present time. We need it for our future. And so, yes, we're going to come out and strongly support it. Well, and I appreciate Wade's time. I appreciate Tony's time. Uh, the school, Jimmy, I appreciate your time. Um, it's just time for us to all get on the same page and work together and not uh, duplicate services, you know, move forward in a, in a strategic, smart plan that works for all of us, not just each of us individually. Um, and I think that's where we can um, make large wins for Fort Payne, honestly. I, I'll agree. I think we need to have a plan. I think we need to prioritize. I there's not anything Wade presented that I disagree with, I like the plan, but we need to prioritize, uh, and, and, and you know, I, grants, if, if there's grant money available, I'm all for it. I, you know, I, they help us tremendously if there's uh, sewer grants, at EBG, or whatever kind of grants that we can get for funding the projects, and we need to, <clears throat> 
you know, we just got to prioritize and work with the grants and whatever we have available. Yeah. Yeah. We just took advantage of a half a million dollar deal that, that we're doing sooner or later. Yes. That you guys did. I, yeah. mean, I, I can't applaud you enough on doing what you've done and what you had to work with. But we, we're going to have to take we're, that step. We're to carry it I know you don't like it, but. I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm moving things forward. I've been conservative for 21 years, and I, you know, it's hard to change. I know. Um, and I appreciate you talking with us. We've, said, you, we've had some good talks about this, and, and I think we all want our town to be as good as we can. And this is not a fight between anybody. This is just, we want to agree to disagree, that's fine, but we, we've got to make a decision, and the sooner we make it, the better. And then that gives us the ability to put this plan in play. If we don't make that first step, we don't need plans, folks. But if we get all the free money we can get, we don't have to float any money. And I'll guarantee you, if we have to hire grant writers to get us free money, it's well worth the money. Exactly. I mean, and there's so many things. And I know that Tony, Brian, myself, and James from uh, Adderholt's office drove through town. And, you know, just like our sidewalks. And they're on Highway 11. There's probably opportunities there to get some funding for that. We just have to be smart about it exactly. and strategic. Well, let me say two or three things. Uh, first of all, when I ran for election, uh, I made the statement that I would veto any sales tax increase. And I found out after a couple of years of being in office that I didn't know near as much as I thought I needed. And I backed up at that time, and when we discussed it uh, uh, in the auditorium that time, that if the council saw fit uh, to increase it, that I would not object to it. I haven't changed my mind. I think that uh, Wade's done an extremely good job of getting all the facts together. Uh, I, I know there will be some opposition. Uh, there's opposition to anything you ever do. Uh, do we absolutely have to have this? We could survive without it. We're surviving now. Could we prosper? That's questionable. That's really questionable. Uh, I would not recommend that the money be earmarked because earmarking just it just ties your hand so much. A lot of times you, you've got things that you need to do and you can't do it because the money's earmarked and a gas tax money is a, is a lot of it that way. Uh, you've got to have certain, certain projects that you can fit into the category. So I'm, uh, I support the project. Uh, I hope that uh, that we would have other discussion, probably will at the next uh, next meeting, as, as proper, and listen to anybody that has objections to it. And I'd like to say, I'm sure we will have some. But uh, anyway, I hate to break a promise, and I made the promise that I would veto a sales tax increase, but sometimes your reasoning just needs to change a little bit. And I think I, I appreciate the efforts that go into this. I really do. I would actually like to hear from our uh, city treasurer, uh, who sees our finances daily uh, and knows that, uh, and ask you the question: If we continue in the way that we're going right now, without any increase, do you? Where do you see us in two, three years? I feel like we only have a few years left where we're going before we would have to do something drastic. That's the bottom line. Hi. I'm like Jimmy. I've been here in Fort Payne for one month and ten days longer than Jimmy has because I was born that much before he was. We graduated high school together in 1967. I wear several hats sitting here today. I'm the water. I'm the uh, school board attorney. I'm the uh, attorney for the city. But I want to take both of those hats. And the only hat I want on today is a citizen of Fort Payne. My father graduated from Fort Payne High School. I graduated. My kids graduated, and my grandkids are working on it. Um, 
During the course of that time, there have been people who had to step up and make tough, hard decisions. One of them, remarkably enough, was Jimmy Durham's daddy, James B. Durham Sr., when he was the president or the chairman of the, of the Board of Education, and there was a lot of criticism about buying land halfway to Valley Head to put our school system on. Uh, there was a lot of criticism and a lot of negativity in 19... 57, when the leaders of the city of Fort Payne uh, stepped up and uh, moved us out of the county system and into the and into our own city system, uh, Jimmy and I went to school uh, in a really old high school, one that would make the current high school look new. Uh, the kid next to me got hit in the head with falling plaster one day during math class, woke him up. Uh, but um, I don't want my grandkids going to that kind of school, and I don't want their kids going to that kind of school. And, and it takes, and I don't want our sewer system not working, and I don't want our downtown looking depleted, and I don't want to become another Coleman. I want to be four Payne, and I want to be better than Coleman. And we are better than Coleman. I don't care what they got. And the only way it's going to happen is if, the people sitting at this table step up. I'm not asking as your lawyer, I'm not asking as a school board, I'm asking as a citizen of Fort Payne, uh, I voted for you and I want you to step up and I want you to do this and I want you to pass this one cent sales tax because I want Fort Payne when my kids are my age to be the best it's been. It's been a great ride for Jimmy and I. Uh, if this was a football game, Jimmy and I are in the two minute drill. Because the time is closing in fast, uh, but but I want it to be a better place, and so I'm asking you as a citizen uh, to do this and do it at the next meeting because it just has uh, all sorts of possibilities. Uh, thanks, I appreciate you letting me say that. And that's what it boils down to is the quality of life for for our families, for everyone in here, for my grandkids, your grandkids, and um, I. I want them to have better than I have. I want them to, I'm like you, I want better than Coleman. And um, I'd just like for Fort Payne to be that bright spot in the, in the state again. Uh, and I would ask Trisha, if you would, to make sure that this is publicized, that maybe we can get some public input and would we consider meeting at night? So that, um, maybe people that are working could come. I just want y'all to remember that if you get 50 people that call up and complain about this, that means 14,950 did not. I agree. <laughs> yeah, I think it's a chance to uh, take a step in the right direction. Uh, I've not ever been a fan of raising taxes uh, and would not actually step out and try to do that if you didn't see the need for it. Uh, when there is a need and when you, when you know that you've been put in a place to, to lead and to be that, that person that you need to be for Fort Payne, to take Fort Payne to the next level, uh, we've got to look at all options. Uh, we, can't, we can't hold anything back and, and I agree. We, you know, we need to look at these projects and we need to prioritize and, and see what needs to be done. And we need to look at every age group, just as Wade has laid out on the, on the PowerPoint, and, and help every, every uh, age group and, and do something to move us forward. <laughs> Anybody else got anything to, uh, to add? We uh, really appreciate you coming. Feel free to, you know, any comments you come up with, uh, you know, we're available anytime. Uh, Red, Johnny, you have anything? I'm good. No, it's, it's, it's a great plane. Uh, I agree with playing on a lot of things. Like I said, I've been serving for a long time. And uh, as long as everybody's talking, Everybody's sitting down and you're coming up with a plan and you're trying to get grant money and stuff like that. And it's I'm not a burden. Here. We don't, we don't, our goal isn't to put a burden on anyone. 
no citizen would we ever want to burden.